uh, going to be with us tonight as we share some thoughts along the topic of evangelism. And uh, for those of you who have followed us since we started this series, I believe this is session seven, and um, I've entitled it The Second Great Awakening. And you may wonder, well, why is all this history stuff important? Why are you emphasizing these things? And uh, a lot of the reason is just simply because when you go back and you look at the history of how the gospel of Jesus Christ has been shared throughout the centuries, going back to the first century, you'll find that it was quite different than what uh, the way in which the gospel is shared today. And um, especially over the last hundred years, there has been what I've often called a systematic de-emphasis, in other words, no longer an emphasis, uh, on genuine regeneration or new birth. Okay, salvation has become uh, something in which someone realizes maybe that they're a sinner or uh, that they want to become a Christian and maybe they say a prayer or maybe they don't even say a prayer. Maybe they just start going to church and then they just consider themselves a Christian uh, from that point forward. And uh, maybe you're watching this right now and you're saying, wow, Brother Robert, I thought that's how it worked. Well, um, that's how things have kind of been going for the last hundred years and uh, it's very different than the emphasis and the preaching uh, and the expectation uh, going back prior to uh, the last hundred years or so. So uh, this is just a topic that has always been really close to my heart because you can't build a church on people who are not truly born again. John 3.3, 3, Jesus said you must be born again. Now, you can't get yourself born again, as it were. You can't do the work yourself. God has to do the work. But you say, well, then what is our role in that? Well, our role is that we hear the word of God, okay, which implies that there has to be a preacher before uh, there, there can be a hearing, all right? And that it also then implies that there has to be someone sent, and that's God's part of it. God sends the preacher uh, that preaches the word of God, and then uh, the hearer is awakened to their need. We'll talk about this again briefly in a little bit for salvation. And then they recognize that they need to turn their life to Jesus Christ. And that means to repent, to turn from all known sin, uh, to stop uh, entertaining the things that are in their life that are a controversy between them and God. And uh, again, uh, the things that I'm saying right now, you may have never heard in all of your Christian life. You may have thought that uh, Christianity was just similar to what you've seen in the youth group and you just started going to church, you call yourself a Christian and things like that, but that's the sum of it. But you'll find as you study the scriptures that uh, becoming a Christian is a very radical change of person, okay? Uh, it's where God takes out the heart of stone. He gives you a heart of flesh. He begins to write his laws on your heart. Okay, he gives you a new spirit. And you begin to walk a completely different direction than you walked before you were born again. Okay, but um, again, we have lost for the most part the whole concept of regeneration as it was understood going back uh, prior to at least the time of, of Billy Sunday. So I just want to share some thoughts with you. And then I have about a 23 minute video clip that I want to share uh, after that. But the title of this session tonight is The Second Great Awakening. So let's go ahead and look at some thoughts from that. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 38. And when he, Jesus, had called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, Whoever desires to follow me, let him deny himself. That means the end of us, as, as our, of our will, of our person. Okay? Now we continue to exist, but it's not us, but it is Christ living in us. We begin to do his will, whereas we had been doing our will. Take up his cross and follow me. You will know that the cross is an instrument of death. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels uh, 
will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to go into that again, but very powerful scripture tonight. Luke chapter 3, verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now you will know that this was particularly uh, relevant, or I should say uh, implying John the Baptist. Um, this was his ministry, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. In other words, to preach the word of repentance. And when we talk about getting the path straight, getting people on the right path and things of that nature, what we're talking about is preaching in such a way that people truly get their heart right with God. Okay, If there is a message that the devil hates is what I'm telling you right now. He will fight what I'm telling you with every ounce of energy that he has ever had or ever will have. He doesn't want people to get their heart truly right with God. You'll remember Simon the sorcerer, he had gone through the process of believing. He had been baptized in water and he was in line to have hands laid on him to receive the Holy Spirit. But yet his heart was not changed. His heart was not right with God. This is what Peter said. And uh, he wanted to buy uh, the, laying, the power to lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted to buy that with money. Okay, He was still in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. He was perishing and his money was perishing with him. Why? Because his heart wasn't right with God. Okay. I often wonder what would have happened if Simon the sorcerer would have got into the church. What if he would have got involved in ministry? He would have fell out and manifested something weird because he was unquestionably demon-possessed because he had bewitched the people with the power of the devil. So he was being used to demons already. What if, he, if it wouldn't have been discerned that this man's heart wasn't right, that he was still moving and the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity was still in sin and would have been welcomed into the church, given the right hand of fellowship, became a pastor or a bishop, if you will, in today's terminology, or, or anything like that. It would have been a horrific situation. So just reading passages like that, let us know how important it is that people truly get their heart right with God. And this is what John the Baptist did when he preached. He preached in such a way that people's heart truly got right with God. And it wasn't just John the Baptist, it was many who would follow after him. Paul the Apostle, you read about it in the latter chapters of the book of Acts, how he had, tells us that he preached repentance and works worthy of repentance all through, uh, all the way from Damascus and to the Gentiles. In other words, his whole ministry, he had been preaching that. Now, you say, well, Brother Robert, I don't hear a lot of repentance preaching today. Well, you're right. You don't. You hear a lot of prosperity. You hear a lot of the love of God. You hear a lot of these different things that were never emphasized up until about the last 50 to 100 years. I'm going to go back 100, but really about the last 50 years. These things were never emphasized the way they are. The emphasis was repent, get your heart right with the Lord, truly be born again of the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit, okay, and be radically changed. Become a child of God, and then you can walk in and know the love of God, okay? And there's a lot that I could say along that line. It just comes to mind, but uh, David Pawson, the late David Pawson, wrote a book that I would recommend to you. It's entitled, Is John 3.16 the Gospel? And he says some things that will curl your hair, I tell you. But, but he's very much right about what he says and how there's been an overemphasis on the love of God in bringing people to Christ. And uh, it becomes a humanistic gospel, a self-serving gospel that is very different than what used to be preached. If you go back to, and we talked about uh, this last week to Jonathan Edwards' 
and, and we'll talk a little bit more about him tonight. Uh, John Wesley and people like that, okay, they were preachers of righteousness. They preached righteousness. They preached that, uh, that men need to turn from their sin and things of that nature, okay? And this is what the, what the feeling was. This is what the message was. This was what the expectation was, okay? And it caused tremendous persecution, um, it wasn't like today, you know, you, you've got practically celebrity preachers today. I mean, they're, they go on television, go on the news, and, you know, you hardly uh, ever, ever see the boat getting rocked. It's not like that when it came to uh, John Wesley and preachers like that. As a matter of fact, I want to read something to you that I came across uh, in my studies for this tonight. This is an example of uh, the situation that Wesley was in. He was, he was preaching and there would be people that would be fighting the ministry. Okay, now this was in 1757. But he's warning here people who come against the preaching of the Word of God, who come against ministries like his own. Now listen to what he said. About noon I reached at Woodseats and the evening at Sheffield. I do indeed live by preaching. He loved to preach. He lived to preach. How quiet is the country now, he said, since the chief persecutors are no more seen? How many of them have been snatched away in an hour that they did not look for it? Sometimes since a woman of Thorpe often swore that she would wash her hands in the heart's blood of the next preacher that came. But before the next preacher, she was carried to her grave. A little before, John Johnson settled at Wentworth, and a stout, healthy man who lived there told his neighbors, After May Day, we shall have nothing about uh, but praying and preaching, he's saying. In other words, after uh, a certain time of day, there's going to be nothing but praying and preaching, but I will make noise enough to stop it. In other words, he's going to cause a ruckus to try to put an end to the praying and the preaching. But before May Day, he was silent in his grave. A servant of the Lord, and then he gives the name, the first name started with an R, but doesn't give the full name, was as bitter as him. And he told many lies purposely to make mischief. But before this was done, his mouth was stopped, and he was drowned in one of the fish ponds. See, he gives an example of three people in 1757 that had died because they had been coming against the preaching of God's Word. You know, it's a dangerous thing to come against the preaching of God's Word. Even on Facebook, it's a dangerous thing. People don't think anything of it. And, and a lot of times people say, well, you know, they're just drunk, or well, they're just high. Listen, God takes in, it doesn't take any account of that. If you go back into the Old Testament, there was a man by the name of Nabal who mean-mouthed David drunk, and God killed that man, literally killed that man. The Bible said that his heart died within him, and the Lord smote him, and he died. Say, well, he was drunk. He didn't know. God didn't take into account that. No, you're responsible for what you say and do, whether you're sober or drunk. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. That's what the Scripture says. We have a lot of Christians today who don't think anything of drinking alcohol, and I wonder how it impacts some of the comments that they make when they're talking online. I wonder if they've had a couple, two or three maybe uh, beers, or maybe they're, they're, they're kind of tipsy, and they're typing. We better be careful. And Wesley is an example of how we need to really be careful. And, and that's the attitude that existed in that time. And I want to just share with you tonight, particularly uh, some individuals that came out of the Methodist movement, came out of the ministry of John Wesley, and these people were known as Methodist circuit riders. Now these people existed here in the United States back in the late 1700s up until about the Civil War. And they would ride around on horseback and they would preach the gospel all over in the rural communities. Now understand in those days, there weren't a whole lot of uh, settlements in the country. 
So they may go a whole day or two in between stops when they were going, but they would ride on horseback and it was a very treacherous job. But these men were often full of the Holy Spirit and they loved the Lord. They were burning for God, okay? And uh, they changed this nation uh, to turn this nation towards God and they preached repentance. And there's so much that I could say. I wish I could spend the whole night just talking about the Methodist circuit riders. But by the middle of the 1800s, there were some 4,000 of these men that rode around the country preaching. People would beat them up, punch them in the face, do all kinds of things to make life difficult for them. Sometimes they didn't even have food. They would rely upon uh, the benevolence of other Methodists that they would encounter along the way or maybe even people who weren't Methodists and God would provide for them. But it was a difficult thing. As a matter of fact, some historians tell us that half of these men died before the age of 30. Their bodies just wore out. Riding on that horse, it would just shake their body to death. I remember reading about, I think it was uh, Cartwright who said that by the time he got back home, his horse was blind and his saddle was worn out. His clothes had been patched up so many different times that you couldn't even tell what the original garment was anymore. And there's just so much that we could say uh, along that line. But God used these ministers. Again, it's what G.W. North said. It's not the preparation of the message because the message is already there. It's the preparation of the messenger. And God is looking for people. And the scripture said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. We're not talking about people that are going out and, and, and having this attitude that doesn't confront sin, that doesn't confront the fact that people desperately need to repent of their sins. But God is looking for a generation that's going to come forward and preach the gospel the way that it has been preached uh, when it truly shook the world and not as it is often preached today. Again, here's a picture of a Methodist uh, circuit rider. I suspect this is what he looked like when he was heading out because he certainly wouldn't have looked like that on the way back. He would have been totally worn slick. This is Peter Cartwright. I mentioned him, one of the most famous uh, uh, of all of the, of the circuit riders. One of the things that struck me about him is that he once told future president Andrew Jackson at the time he wasn't uh, president, but uh, as a matter of fact, the county in which I live is Jackson County was named after him. We've got a statue to Andrew Jackson just maybe two blocks from where I'm sitting. But Peter Cartwright told him that he would, he would end up in hell if he did not repent of his sins. And that made me think of John the Baptist. John the Baptist told Herod and Herodias that they needed to repent, that what they were doing was sin. And this was what you could expect during the Second Great Awakening, again, uh, leading up to the time when uh, around the Civil War, which is in the 1860s. One more thing I want to say that I want to switch this over and we will share uh, this, this uh, video clip that I have for you. Ministers from the time of the Puritans until the early 20th century viewed the hearers of the gospel in one of four conditions regarding salvation. They were either careless that needed awakening. In other words, they needed to hear the gospel. They needed the word of God to awaken them, uh, to turn them from darkness to light, if you will, or maybe some catastrophic thing. God could intervene sovereignly, but typically the word of God is preached. Secondly, they need to be awakened. Uh, when they are careless, they need to be awakened, and they need the Holy Spirit to bring conviction next, which brings the third stage, which is a convicted person, that is God dealing with them. They know God is dealing with them. And at that point, they need to respond rightly to the Holy Spirit. You cannot resist the Holy Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit at the same time. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. And then fourth, if we respond rightly to the dealings of the Holy Spirit, if we turn to God in such a way as, again, Mr. North would say, that God can believe us, then we would be converted we can receive the Holy Spirit and tra be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I just want to share with you, again, this video clip tonight. It's about 23 or 24 minutes long, and it deals specifically uh, with the Second Great Awakening and some of the preachers
uh, that preached during that time. Then we'll come back and maybe we'll share a few more thoughts before we go. In 1791, roughly one year before the start of the Second Great Awakening. Understand that John Wesley was a very organized man, hence the name Methodist, and that he had ministers that traveled not just around England, but all over the world, places like the United States. And their method of preaching was very different than what people were used to at the time. As a matter of fact, they would get made fun of and mocked for their preaching style. They were emotional. A lot of times they were very boisterous and uh, people considered them vulgar. But the thing about it was is that they were effective. They would minister and people would come to Christ. They would be moved. They would be challenged by the power of the Holy Spirit. But again, they were not very well received. People would mock them. And it was on an occasion of spoiled mockery that we could probably trace the beginning of the Second Great Awakening. In 1787, Carrie H. Allen was one of the steadiest youths at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia. But one day he decided to take a walk together with a friend. They entered the store of a merchant with whom Carrie Allen was familiar. Allen, who was always full of silliness, was asked to do an imitation of a Methodist sermon. Mounting the counter, he performed in such a comical and ludicrous manner that his audience was convulsed with laughter. His friend had a bad feeling about it and wondered what calamity would befall him for making fun of such godly ministers. Shortly afterward, the same boys went to make sport at a Methodist meeting in the neighborhood. In a wild turn of events, they would soon learn that God is not to be trifled with and is well able to turn about the false perceptions of even the vilest of scoffers. Upon being subject to true Methodist preaching, with its accompanying Holy Spirit power, the very first person smitten down with conviction of sin was the would-be comedian Carrie Allen. Robert Davidson described the scene. The Reverend Hope Hull was the preacher. He was very impressive and a loud and powerful preacher in brandishing the claims of God's violated law against its transgressors. The house was crowded so that Allen stood on the floor in front of the preacher. Strange to tell, his attention was so arrested and his conscience so awakened that from a deep sense of his guilty and condemned condition, he was made to quake and tremble. At length he lost his strength and fell prostrate on the floor in full view of the preacher and the whole congregation. There he lay after the congregation had been dismissed in great agony of mind, crying for mercy. As he himself at the time declared, he uttered the very first prayer he had ever ventured to put up to his justly offended God in all his life. At length he professed to have surrendered his rebellious heart to God and found peace of mind and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Terry Allen went back to the college and got with one of his professors and they started a prayer meeting. This prayer meeting began to grow and people began to get saved until they started being persecuted within the college and being referred to as Methodists. But in time, this, what started to be the sparks of a revival, began to spread through the college and spread over even to Yale University, where revival broke out there as well. And it was these events that started what we would come to know today as the Second Great Awakening. In time, this move would, would move forward and it would touch other people's lives. And I'd just like to read for you briefly a section from the book Televangelicalism. And I've titled this section, The Birth of the Bible Belt. As with the spread of the gospel in the first century, so also the Second Great Awakening owes its spread in part to religious persecution. 
James McGrady, 1763 to 1817, was a powerful preacher in North Carolina calling sinners to repentance. He experienced revival on a local level in three different places. The trouble was that the revival began to upset their monetary endeavors and soon people more interested in money than mercy had had their fill of him. The secular residents sought to persuade him nicely to leave, but when that failed, they ransacked his church, dropped a letter that was written in blood suggesting that he leave town. It was at this time that he decided to answer the call of God to go west to the settlers to what is now Kentucky. This move would mark the beginning of what we have come to know again as the Bible Belt. One of the greatest outpourings in the history of America took place in Kentucky at a place that we know as Cane Ridge. There was a powerful move of God that took place. Ministers would be ministering all over the grounds and they would be calling sinners to repentance. Understand that this took place somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50 years or so before the Civil War. But I want you to hear an account from Peter Cartwright that speaks to his conversion experience at 16 years old that happened when he attended a meeting at Cane Ridge. He said this, he said, I have seen more than a hundred sinners fall like dead men under one powerful sermon. And I have seen and heard more than 500 Christians all shouting aloud the high praises of God at once. And I will venture to assert that many happy thousands were awakened and converted to God at these camp meetings. Some sinners mocked. Some of the old dry professors opposed. Some of the old starch preachers preached against these exercises, but still the work went on and spread almost in every direction, gathering additional force, till our country seemed to be coming all together to God. To this meeting I prepared a guilty, wretched sinner. On the Saturday evening of the said meeting I went and weeping multitudes bowed before the stand and earnestly prayed for mercy. In the midst of a solemn struggle of soul an impression was made on my mind as though a voice said to me, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Divine light flashed around me, unspeakable joy sprang up in my soul and I rose to my feet, opened my eyes and it really seemed as if I was in heaven. The trees the leaves on them and everything seemed I really thought they were praising God. My mother raised the shout, my Christian friends crowded around me and joined me in praising God and though I have been since in many instances unfaithful yet I have never for one moment doubted that the Lord did then and there forgive me of my sins and give me religion. One of the things that you will notice about Peter Cartwright's testimony is that he could articulate exactly what it was that had happened to him in regards to his conversion experience. This would have been similar to what the Puritans would have called a conversion narrative, which was required, of course, as we've mentioned in the past, for church membership. One of the most critical differences between evangelism and sharing the gospel in the years of the Second Great Awakening and even before is that when people were counseled, when they were anxious for their soul, that is to say they had come under conviction and they were starting to seek the Lord and recognize their need for salvation, they were never told at the end of the process that they were saved, okay? because it was believed in those days that God was the only person who was qualified or, or, and I should say, had the authority to let a person know that they were in fact saved. 
The Bible talks about the witness of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit, that we are the children of God. So people were not told, you are saved. They were not led through a systematic series of scriptures and then asked, do you believe this? Yes. Do you believe this? Yes. Did you repent of your sins? Yes. Well, by the authority invested in me, I now pronounce you saved. Uh, this is kind of the way that it happens these days, unfortunately. But people who preach the gospel in the days of the Cain Ridge Revival, the Second Great Awakening, First Great Awakening, going all the way back to the time of Jesus, would not have understood or recognized the approach that we take today in any way, shape, or form. It came about systematically over time. And I want to talk about that specifically in this entry. Some ideas are like rivers. They are hard to determine the source. The altar call is no different. A great many writers suggest that Charles G. Finney was the source, but the altar call was born upstream of Charles Finney's conversion that took place in 1821. As far back as 1741, Eliezer Wheatlock is said to have asked people who were under conviction to come forward and occupy the front seats of a meeting. But even Charles Wesley is alleged to have used the phrase, quote, Oh, that blessed anxious seat. This was not the altar call as we know it, but it was an embryo. When we continue looking, we see Peter Cartwright, who again was miraculously born again and saved at Cane Ridge, but he became a Methodist circuit rider. He talked about having people come forward in a meeting, but understand that he would lament the fact that people didn't respect the time that people were coming forward to um, seek the Lord. As a matter of fact, he talked about the anxious sinner would try to bring their wounded heart, but the people were just treating him casually as if some of the people had no idea that there were seekers crying out to God there. But Cartwright's direction to the people indicate that he viewed the altar area as a means by which God could deal with the anxious sinners one-on-one -on -one and was not to be hindered. Only seekers were allowed to be in the altar area under his ministry. Helpers, that is to say counselors, were not allowed unless they were invited by a seeker. My impression is that Cartwright believed the people should not be disturbed or distracted in any way. These altar times could go on for hours, and the objective was that the seeker would respond to God personally and work things out between them and God. Coming forward meant nothing except you were coming to pray to God. Only after the person confessed that they had found comfort in the Lord would they be considered hopefully converted. This brings us to Charles Grandison Finney, who is going to popularize the anxious bench going forward. When I rode into town, I drove by the bars on the streets. I rode past all of the brothels. I saw men drinking drunk in the streets. And I'm here to declare to you this afternoon that the times of this ignorance God has overlooked. But now he is commanding all men everywhere to repent. Because he has determined a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And he has proven it and put his seal upon it by having raised him from the dead. And each and every one of you someday is going to be raised from the dead to give an account to God for all of your sins. Understand that this is the type of message that you would have heard if you would have stumbled into a church during the time of the Cambridge Revival or the Second Great Awakening. There was one particular preacher, though, that stood out above them all. He would call sinners to repentance in the most powerful of ways. That man is Charles Grandison Finney. We have thoroughly demonstrated that God has chosen to use both Calvinist and Arminian theologies and ministers for the salvation of souls. In fact, the Cane Ridge Revival was an example of how God used both theological persuasions simultaneously 
but we now come to a minister of a different sort. Charles Grandison Finney, trained as a lawyer, and was converted to Christ in 1821. Not having been raised as a believer, his methods would become so controversial that some historians seek to black out his ministry and influence altogether, suggesting that the Second Great Awakening ended in 1810. He is sometimes depicted as a false prophet or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Finney is best known as a revivalist, an opponent of Calvinist theology, an advocate of Christian perfection, and an opponent of slavery. He was a religious writer and the president of Oberlin College. Ordained as Presbyterian, his unorthodox views of predestination, the fall of man, the atonement, put him at odds with Calvinists and Arminians alike. Finney's theology flew in the face of Calvinist inability with a stridence unknown since the Pelagian controversy. I don't think it immoderate to say that had he lived in the era of the Reformation, theologians and leaders of religious nation-states would have stood in line to put Charles Finney to death. He was the type of man that heresy hunters would dig up and burn their bones. Graveside of Charles Grandison Finney, one of the great preachers of the early 1800s. Finney was unique in that he did not believe in original sin. He believed that sinners sin because they want to sin, basically, and they were not in some way constrained by a sinful nature. So this dramatically affected the way in which he approached evangelism. If you don't believe in original sin, then there's a pretty good chance that you don't believe in regeneration as it is known in the scriptures. So it's important that we take a moment and look at Charles G. Finney and his impact that he made on evangelism as we know it today. Where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? If you're feeling anxious for your soul, I just want you to come right now and I want you to have a seat right here to my left or right here to my right. Just have a seat right there and we will try to counsel with you when the meeting is over. Anyone? Sometimes throughout the course of the meeting if a sinner was starting to feel anxious for their soul they started hearing the gospel in such a way that it was making an impact on their heart. Charles Finney would ask them to come forward and have a seat on what we come to know today as the anxious bench. This would have been a bench right towards the front. They may have came up, sat down just like this near the front where he would be preaching, off to my right, and they would sit here and pray or seek the Lord or they would be very solemn. And sometimes they would go down on their knees, sometimes they would be weeping. But this is the method that was employed at that time and it was Charles Grandison Finney again who was an innovator in this regard there were people who sort of used it before him but certainly he was the one who popularized it this is the first major step that we took towards what we know today as the altar call one of the primary people that Charles G Finney tried to minister to and tried to reach were people who were within the churches who he felt like were not truly saved. They were not born again. So he would minister oftentimes to people, let's say they would be missionaries, missionaries' wives, maybe they would be deacons, deacons' wives, possibly even ministers themselves. And often what people would find out after they heard Charles Finney preach the message of repentance was that they weren't really even saved themselves. I remember one dear lady who was listening to Charles Finney preach and she just fainted and had to be carried out of the service, which wasn't unusual. As a matter of fact, Finney one time described a scene in which he was preaching. God was anointing him powerfully to preach and he said it like this, if I would have had a sword in each hand, I could not have cut them off their seats as fast as they fell. <laughs> 
That's what they did when they went down into repentance, when he had called them uh, according to their sins. But understand this was the environment in those days. It wasn't a real quick fix kind of get saved deal like we have today. It was quite a thing. And one of the things that distinguishes Finney from others as well is that he would go from house to house the day after the service to check up a checkup on the people who had made some kind of a commitment or sat in the anxious bench. And I want to talk to you about that now. Mr. Smith? Miss Smith? I'm here to visit with you this afternoon. You were in service with us last night. And you came to the Lord and repentance and you sat up on the anxious bench and I just wanted to talk to you and maybe see if we could pray with you or answer any more questions you might have. I would be remiss if I did not mention alongside Charles G. Finney a gentleman by the name of Daniel Nash. Some would know him as Father Nash. Father Nash had been a former minister but he was a very powerful prayer warrior. He understood the importance of prayer in regards to a revival. So he would go into town when Charles Finney was scheduled to preach, sometimes weeks in advance. He would maybe find a room, or maybe there would be someone who would loan him a room for the duration of the time he was going to spend in prayer, and even throughout the time of the revival, so that he could just pray and seek God for the revival so that it was bathed in prayer. And in those days, it wasn't just praying, you know, Mary had a little lamb or something like that. They would pray until what they called the spirit of prayer would come upon them. This isn't a special spirit. What it means is that the Holy Spirit would anoint them to pray and seek God for the thing they were petitioning him for. For Daniel Nash, it was for these revivals. The ministry would have not went forward the way that it did without the prayers of a man like Daniel Nash or Father Nash. So it's important that we understand that. It wasn't just something where people were getting up and just preaching and because they were really eloquent. God was moving powerfully because men like Daniel Nash were seeking God in prayer. Understand that not everybody wanted to hear Charles Finney preach. As a matter of fact, a lot of people would just as soon see him ran out of town on a rail than to hear him preach. Because when he preached, it changed people's lives. And maybe if you had a wife who was living like the devil and running around town with you to all the bars or whatever she may have been doing, suddenly she came to the Lord. She doesn't want to do that type of thing anymore. And this would truly anger some of the men. As a matter of fact, one man got so angry that he came to the meeting with a gun intending upon killing Charles Finney. But when he got into the service, the Spirit of God came upon him, arrested him, and before you know it, he was turning his life over to Christ as well. See, this is the type of power. All right. So we have the Methodist circuit riders, Peter Cartwright and others. We have Charles G. Finney, who was a preacher during the Second Great Awakening. He emphasized repentance, but as I was saying towards the end of uh, the video clip there, he did not believe in what we would call today believer's baptism, which is water baptism. Of course, he was a Presbyterian, uh, so he thought that water baptism was divisive. But what we need today is we need the preaching of repentance, which is repentance and faith. Those things kind of go hand in hand. We need water baptism, and we need the receiving of the Holy Spirit in the genuine article. These are the three things that we really need to get back to. Fortunately, um, we've, we have recovered to this point in history, uh, repentance to a large degree, and the idea of regeneration. Of course, we lost a step when we got to Charles Finney because he didn't believe in original sin. He still emphasized repentance and things of that nature, but uh, he did not believe in water baptism. So um, these are just some of the issues that we uh, are looking at as we move forward. So I just want to pray before we go tonight. Heavenly Father, I'm just so grateful for those who have
joined us tonight or who may join us later in the future, maybe even on YouTube. And Lord, I, I just pray for them, Lord, that you would illuminate their mind, especially if they are a person who's never repented or, or if they've came to you and they are wondering, am I really genuinely saved? Lord, I pray that you would touch their heart, that they would get into the Word of God and they would seek your face, Lord, until they come to a to an assurance that they know that they were truly uh, saved and truly born again, that your Holy Spirit is witnessing with their spirit that they are children of God. Lord, I pray for people who are uh, entertaining things in their life, Lord, that you have your hand on and they're not they're not submitting them. I pray for those that are resisting the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would strive with them, Lord. And I just pray that they would turn to you. Lord, and I pray for ministers who preach the gospel, that they would get back into the Word of God, get into the book of Acts, that they would forget how they were taught to preach, forget about what the pattern has been for the last 50 or 100 years, and let's return back to the scriptures. We live in desperate times. We live in a time where the world is just totally going away from God. And Lord, I just pray that you would raise up ministers who still believe in the power of the gospel, that still believe in preaching under the anointing, preaching with power, preaching repentance, and seeing folks truly get their heart right with God, truly be born again, and truly receive the Holy Spirit. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I suppose next week, uh, or possibly the next week, things have gone a little longer than I thought. We'll probably conclude this series, but at least one, possibly two more weeks. God bless you. Thank you for joining us.